Our Father and our God, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, in whom we have been identified with Christ. And I just ask your blessings, your continued blessings upon these studies. I ask that you would filter out all of the error, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. We are aware of just how keenly aware we are of just how infinite, how immense your word is and how limited our understanding is. We thank you, Father, for all that we are in Christ. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com again. We're continuing on in our study with, through John. So just as a, just to quickly review, John the Baptist, John the Baptizer. Jesus came unto his own people, Israel. He came unto the Jews. He came unto his own and his own received him not. And we're looking at John the Baptist identifying through water, identifying his people, God's people, not everyone, but identifying them with Christ. They need to be identified with their Messiah. The word baptism means to identify, to be identified with. That's what the word means. But of course, we know that one would come as the text says, baptizing in the Spirit. And so we see the distinction, uh, the separation between Israel and the church as two distinct separate entities. Those who were baptized or identified uh, uh, with Christ through water baptism and that through John the Baptist were not indwelt as we are by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came upon them just as, as, as he did in, in the Old Testament temporarily for service and then left they were not indwelt as we are the church is unique in that sense just to, to kind of quickly review John knew his cousin Jesus of Nazareth he knew him according to the flesh they were cousins I believe that the text says the text is saying that John didn't actually comprehend that his, his cousin uh, Jesus of Nazareth was in fact the promised Messiah of biblical prophecy until there came a point in which God revealed that fact to John. And the question in my mind here, and I pointed this out in my last video, is when when did he know did he know that? When did he know that? And uh, I uh, suggested that the the dove being like a spirit is contrasted with his baptizing in water. And I'm not sure that a, a careful examination of the text is not revealing to us that John didn't know who Jesus was until God revealed him to John. And I don't know when that was. He states that he did not know him. He states that twice in the text. And I pointed out how important it is to take notice of something that the Holy Spirit repeats. When, he re when God repeats himself, we should take notice. He did not know him. And he announced Jesus as the Lamb of God before the baptism took place, which would confirm what he knew. 
the dove sign didn't cause John to believe. It, con it just confirmed what he already believed. And looking at verses 35 and 36, uh, there's a couple of things I want you to, to, to remember that, and, and I didn't want to build more on that than what I should, but the next day after John stood and two of his disciples, and, and that word stood is a pluperfect tense, which is very rare in the grammar. It's a grammatical construction that is rare in the New Testament. And I believe that the Holy Spirit is pointing out to us that it's not John's activity, but, but it's about what John said. It's the word that he spoke, and it was the word of God. And so what John said was so simple. He said, Behold God's Lamb. Uh, in the original text, it, it is narrowed down to three words, Behold God's Lamb. Now the two who stood with John the Baptist, one being Andrew, they, these were obviously John's disciples. They were followers of John. And I believe that, that what the Holy Spirit wants us to see in this is that uh, it's not some, some uh, purpose, plan, program of John the Baptist. John, he is said to have stood, stood firm. The, the grammar asks us to look back to the point where he stood firm, firm in what he was saying, firm in what he was proclaiming. He's not trying to build a following. In fact, he lost disciples by preaching what he preached. He lost them in a good sense. He lost them to, to Jesus. And as I pointed out in my last video, I believe you people don't follow me. You follow Christ. We are, in, in, in essence, by preaching the gospel of grace, we are calling God's people upon God's people, those whom He chose in Him before the foundation of the world, to be identified with Christ. But it is a spiritual baptism, not a water baptism. So two of these people came to Christ because of the truth spoken by John. One of them came to Christ because his brother went and found him and brought him to Christ. And then the fourth one, nobody found him. God doesn't need our help. Christ Jesus himself sought out Philip. So there's four different situations there going on in the text. People are introduced to Christ by the proclamation of the word. Others by hearing the word through those who are close to him or associated with them, such as uh, as Andrew and, and Simon, and others come to Christ because the Holy Spirit reaches them independent of any other testimony. And the word Simon, as I pointed out, is an interesting uh, Hebrew word that means hearing. And in the 42nd verse, we're told Simon, the son of Jonah, and you can't argue the fact that it's really Simon, the son of John. The word John means a gift from God. So Simon, Simon means hearing. John means a gift from God. Therefore, we could say, we have every right to say, that the ability to hear is a gift from God. And that's, we actually see that in the uh, historical account. And I find that absolutely stunning. I find that amazing. Romans 10 says faith comes by hearing and the ability to hear comes from God. Why do you not understand my words or my speech? Because you cannot hear my words. Scripture is absolutely clear on the fact that His people will hear and His people will respond. And if they're going to hear, God has to give that gift of hearing to them. And it seems to me in the very introduction that we have here, the Holy Spirit has carefully chosen very specific words to point out that through the gift of hearing, we hear the gospel and we become stones. 1 Peter 2.4, we are living stones in Christ. You're a stone, I'm a stone. Now, there's something interesting about this. Peter... 
Peter, folks, would, would, be, would be said to be in the future. Okay, Jesus is speaking to Peter, and he said, in the future, by Paul, you, would, you will be said to be a rock. You see the future tense in the, in the structure of the verse. You will in the future be called by Paul a rock, solid, sure, and steadfast. That's in, that's in contrast now to uh, Simon, son of John, or Jonas. The word Jonas is a Hebrew word whose original meaning is a dove. Okay? So, rock contrasted with dove. And it may be that Jesus had respect to that when he gave Simon the name Peter. You now bear a name that denotes uh, uh, how should I say it? Duplicity, betrayal, uh, being timid, afraid. You shall in the future, however, future tense, be called by a name denoting firmness and constancy, which is what Paul did. Jesus always called Peter Simon. And Jesus, we know, is the chief cornerstone. You look at the word in the Greek, it is the word is, is lithon. It's a different word. We are all living stones, okay? Lithon, same word. Jesus is the chief lithon. We are living lithons, if I could say it that way. Peter, however, the rock, is not to be confused with our being stones. It's a different word. It's Petros. So, that's what I'm seeing in the text. Now, as soon as these two disciples, they, as soon as they heard John speak, they followed Jesus, and then in verse 38, then Jesus turned. He turned. Now, to me, I find that interesting. He turns and he looks intently at them. He looked at them and he said unto them, What do you seek? What are you looking for? And that, folks, is a tremendous tremendous question I think it's a question that's relevant to every Christian who professes to be a Christian what are you seeking you want to follow somebody who has a bigger crowd John the Baptist what are you seeking perhaps we could say what are you seeking in me and I think their answer is profound, and I think her, their answer is engineered by the Holy Spirit. We want to be with you. Where do you live? Where do you abide? The word in the original text is, where do you abide? That, that word abide is minnow. We see the same word in John 15, abide in me. Abide in me. Minnow. In the Greek, same word. Not we want to be we want to be famous. Now, now I, I will admit that later on, they're going to ask whether they can sit on his right hand or or his left in the kingdom of God. But but not at this moment. This is the instant when they're first introduced to Jesus Christ, when they've listened to their leader John the Baptist, and they're now ready to follow Christ, God's Lamb. The one who takes away the sin of the world. Where do you live? We want to be with you. We want to know where you live and how you live. We want your life, not our life. I hope I'm not reading too much between the lines there, folks. But that's, that's how I see that. And that, my friends, ought to be the drive, the motivation, the concern of every one of us who know our Lord Jesus Christ. We want to know where you live, they said. And they call him rabbi. Now they'll grow up and soon they'll call him Lord, but here they call him rabbi or master. Where do you live? Where do you dwell? 
and it gets even more interesting from this point. Now, many have looked at this and they say, well, you know, there's verses in Scripture that say that Christ has no place to lay his head. And what the Lord is saying to him is that he doesn't have any permanent human dwelling place. You know, his rest is doing the will of God. And he won't be through with his work in order to enter into that rest until he's been, you know, convicted, tried, uh, condemned, crucified, buried, raised from the dead. Never did that text seem to indicate or even mean to indicate that he had no roof over his head and no place where he could lay down and get some human rest. So he said unto them, come and see, come and see. And I want you to take note of the fact that this is not an invitation. Would you like to come and see? I would like for you to come and see. Would you come and see? I hope you come and see. It's not an invitation. It's not an invitation. This is God Almighty, incarnate in human flesh, speaking to them, saying, come and see. The statement is, is, is equivalent to God, God parting, you know, say, saying, let there be light. Okay? We're looking at God Almighty here. This is a present imperative, passive voice. It's a passive imperative. The text makes it sound as though I invite you to come. Folks, he not only commanded them to come, they have no choice but to come. The grammar makes that absolutely crystal clear here. And it's hard for me to fathom how that modern Christianity could remove from God the ability to provide and care for his own family. You know, like, that, like that's really my child, but, but, but he wouldn't have anything to do with what I wanted, so he went to hell. I didn't want him to do that, but he, but he did. And what kind of God is that? Come and see. And the word see here is an aorist imperative. It means to perceive with the mind. And they came and saw where he dwelt, and they abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. And so they stayed with him. They stayed with him for the whole day. Now, I hope once again, I'm not reading too much in between the lines here, folks. But... If we're looking at Roman time, that's 10 o'clock in the morning. If we're looking at Jewish time, that's 4 o'clock in the afternoon. The, the Romans started counting time from 12 midnight. The Jews started counting time from, from uh, essentially sunrise. So it's either 10 in the morning or it's 4 in the afternoon. And many of the commentators have said, well, you know, we don't really know, but they couldn't have spent the day with him. You know, if it's four in the afternoon, Jewish time, you know, well, it would have probably said that they spent the evening with him. I don't know whether it was four in the afternoon or ten in the morning. I, I'm guessing that it was probably Roman time. What I do know is that they spent the rest of the day with him. And that, my friends, that is what we do. That's what we do. Again, I want to say, I, I just hope I'm not reading too much uh, sim symbolism into this or reading too much in between the lines. But, but, dearly beloved, we are all children of light. We're children of the day. We're not of the light, but we're not of the night, nor of darkness. We spend the day with Him. We're children of the day. Not only the day of the Lord, but our relationship with Him is unbroken. Our fellowship might be busted. But you know, all the heck, but our relationship can't be. And so they spent the whole day with him. And I, folks, I love the symbolism here. I wonder kind of what went, went on during that day. Must have been amazing. If we look simply at the history, not the theological lessons that are being taught us, the spiritual lessons that we draw from the text, but if we look at the history, what we what we know what we learn is that they go back to their old job until he calls them for service that's something worthy to take note of of course we don't see that immediately here in the text later on through a broader study of the history we come to realize that fact which i think is is interesting but there's a permanent change in their lives even though they went back to their old jobs. And think about the symbolism in that. 
One of those two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon, Peter's brother. The other one, of course, is the one whom the Holy Spirit is using to write this epistle. The first thing he did, the very first thing he did, the first thing he did was he spent the day with Christ, which was then followed by what? Andrew finding his own brother, Simon, and said unto him, We found the Messiah. The interesting thing to me is that he found his own brother, and that's what happens. We got There's more symbolism there. Modern Christianity somehow has, has this idea that everybody's a brother. You know, we're all brothers in the Lord when nothing could be further from the truth. There is a family of God, and there is a family that's not God's family. There's the seed of the woman, and there's the seed of the serpent. God includes all of those who are so intimately tied to Christ that He can use the singular seed. We are His seed. And modern Christianity says, well, we don't want to go along that path, so, so we're going to change a goat into a sheep. And I've, I've pointed out, before, I don't know, numerous, on numerous occasions, nothing that any evangelist can do will change tear into weed or goats into sheep. I believe that the Holy Spirit is telling us that the activity of the Christian is bringing people, you know, to Christ. And, and in bringing people to Christ, that is a family activity. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. He's not ashamed to call us brethren, but that doesn't apply to every human. It applies to the family and the household of God. And I find it interesting that the Holy Spirit doesn't spend any time pointing out, you know, to us here just how much Simon Peter argued. Uh, what do you mean, Messiah? I mean, you know, what does he look like? You know, where was he born? What's he done? What? How do you know he's the Messiah? You know, you must be insane. I mean, you see none of that in the text. None of that. Now, as we've gone through this epistle, folks, we've seen some amazing things. We, we've, we've, we have seen that John replied by quoting Scripture when he was confronted by the Jews. We, we saw that Jews, the Jews should have understood. This is the ecclesiastical system of his time. The, relig the, the religious experts, they should have understood. We, we, we saw that John didn't exalt himself. We saw that the Jews valued only John's credentials, of which he didn't have any. We saw that Christ's baptism was as being ordained into the priesthood. We saw that the Messiah is quite possibly entering uh, where Christ entered. In, he's entering into His ministry where Israel entered the Promised Land. We saw that baptism in the epistles is baptism of the Holy Spirit. I pointed out that the Jews wouldn't have, would not have ordained Jesus Christ to the priesthood. They didn't know Him. The text says they did not know Him. Jesus, we know from history, uh, our history lessons, we know that Jesus didn't, He spent very little time in Jerusalem. We saw how John said he was not worthy to untie his sandals. I pointed out how I believe that that is, that, that is a, that's in the activity of a slave. I'm not worthy to be your slave. That's total depravity, folks. Behold the Lamb of God, not the lion, the Lamb. Okay, The Jews were expecting a, a conquering monarch, you know, a king, not a suffering servant, not a lamb. I pointed out how Abraham and Isaac, they went on alone. They left their servants, went on alone in the offering of Isaac as a sacrifice. No synergism. I talked about how Christ removed Adam's transgression for all men. And 
how John's message of grace and truth was proclaimed outside the ecclesiastical system, the religious system, in which today, folks, the modern evangelical religious system, world religious system based on human merit would basically, uh, basically, in, in essence, what, what it believes is, is that there's nothing good outside that their system, that system, that everything outside their, their circle, everything outside their realm of, of logic and understanding and activity is, you know, everything out there is, is, is of no value. There's nothing good. And folks, the reason I pointed out all these things is so that you might be able to somehow draw some parallels, modern day practical applications of these wonderful New Testament truths of, of early Christianity, of Christianity's early days with what's going on in our lives today. Verse 48. I want to touch on that for a close. It's uh, in declaring Nathaniel, Jesus declares Nathaniel to be a guileless Israelite in whom there is no guile. There's no deceit. The word in the Greek is deceit. No deceit. Jesus declares him to be one who, who does not seek to win blessing by earthly means, but by prayer and trust in God. Nathaniel belonged to Christ before he knew that he belonged to Christ. Okay? You, you can't come away from the text, folks, without seeing anything other than the fact that bef Nathaniel belonged to him before he realized it. Well, so did Paul, the Apostle Paul. In looking at his conversion on the road to Damascus, same same idea, same is true of you, same is true of me. Nathaniel belonged to Christ before he knew he belonged to Christ. Of course, that's true of all of them. And it's not improbable that, that Nathaniel was accustomed to retire to the shade of a certain tree, perhaps in his garden or in a grove, for the purpose of meditation and prayer. It's, that's not unlikely that that's what we're looking at here. The Jews were much in the habit of selecting such places for private devotion. And in, 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 in such places as, as this of, of stillness, there is something especially favorable for meditation and prayer. Our Savior worshiped that way. He worshiped in such places. So if you compare Scripture with Scripture, it's, it's not improbable that Nathaniel was engaged in private devotion and Christ knew his thoughts, he knew his desires, he knew his secret feelings, his wishes, so in this sense, Jesus knew Nathaniel. He knew. And Nathaniel knew that Jesus was God in the flesh. So I believe that we can conclude from this that Jesus sees what is done in secret. He's God Almighty. He sees us when we think little of it. He sees us, especially in our private devotions. He hears our prayers, our meditations. He judges our character, chiefly by our private devotions, because those are secret. The world doesn't see that. I mean, in our closets, we show what we are. Here is one without guile, without hypocrisy or deceit. I saw thee. Christ was omnip uh, omnipotent, he, uh, uh, omnipresent, omniscient, everywhere, knows all things. 
And that most definitely won Nathaniel over. Some of you may know that the Gospels were, were translated into Syriac, uh, Aramaic, early on. And, and it's said of Nathaniel in the Syriac Dictionary that his mother laid him under a fig tree when the infants were slain. Now, if that's true, he must have now known that Jesus was the person that Herod was seeking to destroy. That's interesting to me. He must have known that he was the Messiah, the King of the Jews. Verse 49, Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. And that's where I'm going to have to, to leave off here till next time, folks. This is Steve. I love you all. I truly do. Stand firm in God's love and grace for you. Thanks for watching.